Welcome, everyone, to Ladder Daily Digest. We honor podcasters and creators of all kinds. Today, we have on us with us Shannon and Bryce of the Glass Box Podcast. Yes. And so, yeah, um, welcome to the show. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having us. We're excited Glad to be, be here. here. Yeah. So we'll start right. off. We'll go ahead, Maven. You start off by saying. No, I was just going to say we're, we we're interested in the, the background of yeah how the podcast got started and how you guys came together. Um, and I think if I understand right, it actually started with Bryce. So maybe the the first beginning steps probably. So we'll start with you, Bryce. We'll we'll do that. Okay. How did this get on, uh, on the ground? And and um, yeah, what's your story behind that? Yeah, um, I guess I'll kind of just uh, rewind the clock a little bit. So uh, I was born, raised uh, Davis County, Utah. Um, grew up Mormon, born in the Covenant, pioneer heritage. Um, but I kind of just I didn't like going to church. <laughs> uh, you know, as a typical teenager, I didn't like going. So about age 16, I said, I'm done. I'm not going to church anymore. And uh, luckily, I had one older sibling who had gone through the fights with my parents uh, uh, and had broken away from the church. And uh, my parents had a bit of a learning exercise with that. Um, and man, so they, they didn't push me hard to stay in the church or they didn't uh, force me to go, which was I mean, I, yeah. uh, judging from how many conversations I've had with people who didn't have a walk like that, uh, it saved me a lot of mental health struggles uh, and trauma and abuse that happens very frequently in the cult. The first sibling takes the brunt uh, yeah, yes. of the, the disappointment, for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, av after I left, um, I moved out of Utah, I had to get out of Mormonism out of Morador. And uh, so I moved uh, to uh, Colorado, um, living with some family very briefly and began exploring the world and learning uh, about the world and, and finding um, elements of the world that fascinate me and beginning to study those. And one of those was obviously the history of the church. I wanted to learn about how things came to be. So I was uh, at the time driving trucks and I wanted to find a podcast that went through a serialized history of Mormonism. Uh, and that podcast didn't exist. So I said, I'm just going to, I'm going to make it. So I did. And I started making Mormonism and that was a serialized history of Joseph Smith. Uh, however, along the way, um, there were a couple of uh, times when like current events would come up that I would want to talk about on the show, but it was, you know, it was a structured uh, historical chronology. You can't really just, in, you know, implement current events. So uh, I kind of um, spun off another project that I had uh, started a long time ago that was Class Box. It was actually a scripture study podcast. And it had just kind of gone dormant because I got bored with the project. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to revive this. This is going to be a current events podcast. Uh, so that was, you know, the reboot of Glass Box. And it is, you know, it aims to find what has slipped through the cracks of uh, the media uh, coverage of Mormon stories. So, how did you uh, so come up with the name Glass Box. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's just a, it's an allusion to early uh, Joseph Smith history. Uh, as I said, it started as a Book of Mormon study podcast. I was reading uh, books that were similar to the Book of Mormon from the time that could be uh, serve as sources for the Book of Mormon. So I started with the Late War of eighteen twelve um, and just read through. I mean, I think I got like halfway through it, and I was like, "All right, so okay, so it has superficial similarities to the Book of Mormon. This is fun. Okay, let's point these out." I'm bored with this. And clearly the, the download numbers show that the listeners are bored with this as well. So it just mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of went defunct. But um, the, the idea was that when Joseph Smith was working on the manuscript for the Book of Mormon, he had a box, a wooden box that was used to transport window glass. Uh, you know, windows uh, in the 19th century, mm -hmm. 18th century glass was extremely expensive. So when you would move, you would uh, pull up the carpet from your home and you would pull out the, the glass out of the, the window frames and you would take that that with you as part of the uh, the you know as part of your possessions because they were really expensive uh so this box this wooden box was used to transport glass in it uh and joseph appropriated it and uh, used it to hold the manuscript of the book of mormon for a few years uh while he was hmm. working on it uh so it was kind of like all right so this what's in the glass box because that explains the book of mormon and then i kind of expanded that concept out to be like whatever is hiding in the glass box is like that's going to tell us the real story of what's going on so that's kind of what we use is like we're, we're we want to find like the insider scope we want to find the the niche detail that everybody has missed and that that's kind of what we try to focus on Bryce uh, now so, I've got movie quotes running through my head what's in the box 
<laughs> oh no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so to to uh, to send it back over to Shannon, I had a co-host that I started with, Braden. Uh, he was a really fun co-host, uh, former uh, return missionary, um, ex Mormon, and he was a lot of fun to do the project with. Uh, and then we had uh, somebody who would comment on every single episode, and it was clear that this person would read or would be listening to the episode and would type out what they were, you know, responding to us as if they were having a conversation with long us. ass comments long <laughs> yeah and, it's, and the episodes the podcast episodes are like three hours already so like you know these these paragraphs of text of this one listener responding so and it, it was every episode so eventually we elevated this listener to the resident general authority of the podcast and read her comments at the end of every single episode and finally we were like <laughs> we just got to invite this person on and get their story we got to hear about this so we invited <laughs> shannon onto the show and to tell her story and how she came to you know just tell us about her uh, and then that kind of sparked a, a bud of friendship, a seed of friendship that has uh, evolved into what we have today. That's awesome. I love it. <laughs> so, now so I think we over to, over to Shen. <laughs> well, yes, I was born in the church as well. In fact, I was the first in my family born in, under the covenant, a fourth child. Uh, my mother was Southern Baptist when my parents got married. So they got baptized. She was baptized later, took a few years and then sealed when they had three children. But for me, I was raised in the church, true believing member and everything. And my first doubt showed up when I was 10 because, you know, we learned about the universe and how it's never ending and no beginning, no end. It's just, you know, there's no walls to it. There's anything. It's just all there. And I was like, so, you know, of course, I grew up in middle of Mormon, Morador and, and heard all about as man is, God once was, and as God is, man may become for years. Heard it at seminary, heard it everywhere at church and everything. And so I was like, okay, so God created a universe like other gods did. And, and I said this to my dad, I was like, so if God created the universe and the universe doesn't end or begin anywhere and doesn't have any walls or anything. What did he put it in? And dad looked at me. He's like, what? And I was like, what, what did he put it in? If it's then never, never ending. And there's other universes and what did they put them in? And he sat there for a long moment. And then he says, does this matter to your salvation? And I said, no. He says, then when you die, you can ask God. And I'm like, Okay. And that's when I heard about Camilla Kimball's thing of take your doubt and put it on a shelf, close the door. And when you come back later, it'll disappear. So I started my doubt shelf and they just kept building up, you know, <laughs> like the first time I read the Book of Mormon and I'm like, why did Nephi have to kill Laban? He was, he was passed out drunk. I've seen people passed out drunk. You can't wake him if you light a firecracker next to their head. He could have just taken his clothes and rolled him into the bushes. Why did he have to kill him and have clothes, clothes covered in blood and piss and alcohol and poop and everything else? You know, all this stuff. So, you know, this went on. I read the Book of Mormon over and over thinking if I read it again, maybe I'll get the answers to all the doubts. And, you know, went to BYU, served a mission got married in the temple, kept reading the Book of Mormon, kept piling up more doubts. Can I, can I ask you a question about the doubts? Yes. So I, I never considered myself as having doubts. Um, when I had a testimony, I just, I knew, and I took for granted that the church was true. And so if I had anything that maybe didn't make sense or didn't click or connect, I, I never, got to the point where I was like, does this mean what I have been taught is not true? That was never there. So any question I had for the majority of my life, including, you know, my teen years and in, uh -huh. into my young adulthood, um, honestly, yeah, whenever it, I, it, it just seemed to me an unanswered question, but it, it never affected whether I feel like the church is true or not. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, when you say you have doubts, mm -hmm. um, is that what, what you I mean? mean? Cause, yeah, because I can say that I had, you know, things were said that didn't make sense to me. Is that a doubt or is it only a doubt if it makes you say, I don't know if this is like really real or not? It was, these were all things that would make me question my testimony of the church is true, which I was like, okay, okay, the church is true though. So this means something's wrong with me because that's yeah. what I was told. These were because yeah. I didn't have enough faith and I was wrong. And so 
in essence, they were doubts. I didn't see them as a doubt then because that would mean I was questioning the testimony, which mm-hmm. I wasn't willing to question the premise then. Brainwashing was right. too strong. And so what do they say it's it's okay to have questions, but it's not okay to have doubts. Yeah, exactly. And so I that's what, you know, stuff it all away. And it wasn't until there were a few things that happened. Things like I heard about Thomas Murphy's study into the DNA, mitochondrial DNA of the Book of Mormon and his absolute proof that it wasn't they weren't from Israel. And I that was a huge thing for me because I'd also been taught that science are the true laws of God. And right. so this was just so there, something... There's no conflict between true religion and true science. So exactly. It's like there's that one... Together. Yeah. And so I was like, wait. And then in 2011, oh, I got Shannon. cancer. Or we found out I had cancer. Yes. Uh, how did you hear about the Thomas Murphy thing? In an article or a podcast? Or do you remember? I heard about it on news stuff and article stuff and heard people talking about it. I did later see him on Mormon Stories which that was my favorite ever Mormon stories podcast episode still is. Um, well, and we'll I watched put that it in like, the show description. Too, Cause that was, I watched it probably three times in a row going, Holy shit. So, you know, but that was also later when I was willing to think to, to question the premise when I was willing to question, is the church actually true? And so, yeah, in 2011, we found out I had cancer. And when you go through cancer treatments, and I had nine months of that, your entire immune system is wiped out every treatment. So I did not go to church because church is a Petri dish because everybody goes to church sick because they're too afraid of feeling guilty for not going to church. So they're like, no, God won't make anybody else sick because I have enough faith to go to church. You know, Or I just don't want to be around my kids. So I'm going to send, you know, that kind of thing. So I just avoided church, which meant... I was away from the brainwashing. And at that point, I wasn't going to the temple anymore because, you know, especially a temple, I'm not going to be in there, which is a definite Petri dish because who gets up and walks out? (laughs) You have everybody staring at you. You're the walk of shame, you know? Right. And then especially there's less touching now, physical touching. But Um, there there was more then. Yeah. yeah. And, And we're talking about like, especially hands. Mm-hmm. You know, and so with the up close officiants, and personal, right at the veil, yeah, right, right, and just you know, in in you know, they, they were doing these handshakes. The officiant would go and do it with every single person in the mm-hmm. room. So anything that any one person had, there was yep. one person touching everybody in that room, and so yep. yeah. So I just wanted exactly. to point that out, yeah, yeah for people who yeah. haven't been, yeah, so much, yeah. And so it was nice because I pulled back because when you're not getting brainwashed every week. Then you start taking off your rose colored glasses because that's what brainwashing does. And so after that, I found reasons not to go to church, legitimate reasons, health reasons, because I have so many health problems. I could spend an hour telling you about all of them up to that I have now. Um, And I just kept pulling back more and more and more. And over time, it was, I was FEMO physically and mentally out until finally the t- November 2015 policy came out and I couldn't do it anymore. That was the final straw. That's when the closet door burst open and I was like, nope, I can't at all. So that was the point. It was just like, I'm out. Yeah. And I think I'm going to jump in again, just, just because okay. I, I try to be aware of, of when we all know these things, but like the, mm-hmm. the November 2015, that's really, that's kind of insider language. And, and most people watching the show, will know what it is. But just in case, if we've got somebody brand new to this sphere and they're like, what is that? Um, what what was the November 2015 That policy? was when they spoke out and said, children of LGBTQ plus parents cannot join the church until they're over 18 and they have to disavow their parents first, which yeah. is foul. I mean, I don't think they should be even in the church because the church treats LGBTQ plus people as marginal. But right. that that was beyond foul. They aren't. Yeah. That, they were and never I that bad it, with children of polygamous families. Right. Even though they try to pretend like they disavow all polygamy, they don't. They just disavow some. But it's like, and it even involved people. if you if you were if it was a parent that um, 
you didn't live with or, or was cut off from you, you know, if, if they were living um, the gay lifestyle as it, as it's called, quote unquote, but, but you're with your, your good Mormon heterosexual parent. parent. Yeah, yeah. Like it's just all um, you still it's couldn't, um, or even if the, they'd had a, um, a homosexual relationship in the past, but we're now, you know, maybe they, they gave that up, um, you know, to, to get back on the path and now they've done everything they were, that would still affect that. That's my understanding is that would still yeah. affect their children. So were, even if you're doing the right thing, according to exactly. what the church wants. Yeah. And one of the things that got to me the most is they were worse to the kids whose parents were married, the mm. married, you know, homosexual relationship kind of thing. They were worse to, and I'm like, no, everything in this church is about marriage. You right. know, especially like when the when the Supreme Court did the Burgerfell decision, I I was like, hey, this way Mormons can still get married because the the covenant in the temple with the law of chastity is you will have no sexual relations with anyone you are not legally and lawfully wedded to. Doesn't right. say husband and wife. Mm -hmm. It might now. I think they changed it. It does now. now. Yep. Yeah, but at the time they did it. And I was like, it fits because now they can get legally and lawfully wedded. So therefore, it fits with these covenants. The Mormons can find a way to slide around it without having to actually do anything. And they didn't. They went full on, hard on worse than before. That's right. Yeah. Shacking up was bad. And so getting married is more. It's even worse. Yeah. But it to should them. be moral. It mm -hmm. should be moral. Yeah. And so that did, it made me angry. And yes, the church did dial it back um, openly, sort of. yeah. but they, they went kind of back to it, just did it really super quiet without announcing it, because that is their attitude, the attitude of the people at the top. And, and that's the one that just made me the most angry. And that I'm was just, a big moment for me, too. I, I remember because I was still under kind of the delusion that, that progress was being made, mm -hmm. you know, and that eventually, I, you know, I, I was the same what people say, like, look, with the 1978 policy um, or, you know, or when the policy against uh, black members of the church being able to go to the temple or hold right. the priesthood for males, like that got rolled back. So I, I thought this was that was the direction things were going. So for me um, and I my testimony was struggling at that point, but I wasn't willing to admit it to myself, let alone anyone else. But that was definitely a moment where I felt so strongly and surely like in my heart that that was that it was wrong yeah it was it was not correct mm -hmm. and it was a huge backwards step and mm -hmm. honestly I, I wasn't prepared to deal with it but it was that was a rough moment for me yeah that was just an arrow to the heart that mm -hmm. let everyone know just Shannon know. how did you hear about that do you have the bishop's manual <laughs> I did. Actually. Or did you hear it on a podcast somewhere? <laughs> well, I think it hit the news. It, it was because it was silent. They did it silently. It was leaked. It was I don't leaked. remember who leaked it. And I, I feel like the actual part of statement. It, I know. Yeah, it was. It was terrible. Uh, that just was. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, after that, it did take me a while to really come to terms with everything because. I had to look back and I was hard on TBM trying to prove to myself that that I was right to believe all this. I And I loved public speaking, so I got asked to talk a lot. I was teaching a lot. I did all these things. And, you know, I read the, oh God, read the Book of Mormon more than 65 times. And I know it was that because I kept tally marks in my seminary scriptures and there were 13 of those. <laughs> And then I got a new set of scriptures and I didn't because they were the expensive ones that, you know, you didn't have a place right inside the front cover to write on. So well, I know it's more than 65. 65 years old. I am not. You're supposed to read it once a year. I read it 18 times on my mission. I read it once a month. In fact, wow. I read it three times in the three weeks I spent in the MTC. I do read that fast. I can read a 500 book page book in a day. So, <clears throat> Yeah. Awesome. It, I was really hard on into it. And so I did spend a lot of time trying to work through the trauma of it. And it, it was a slow, a slow segue into watching podcasts on YouTube and everything else. And then I started listening to naked Mormonism on there. And then I saw one listed as this is the last one. And I was like, Oh, because I've been looking him up on Patreon, but I was like, well, okay. So I looked him up on Patreon anyway, the naked Mormonism. So I thought maybe there's extras on the ones he's done. 
I didn't realize it meant this is the last one on YouTube. It was just, I thought it was the last one of mm -hmm. naked Mormonism. And so I looked up on Patreon and this glass box podcast shows up and I was like, I've never even heard of that. So I was like, well, if he's ending naked Mormonism, maybe I'll just sign up there at glass box. <laughs> I had no idea what it was. There was like 10 episodes total. So I listened to them all in the first few days. And then, and I started commenting on it because one of the things I noticed with this, which is something I always like to point out, because in religions, pretty much every religion in the entire world, since the beginning of religions, men and women are treated differently. Some of them, it's a little bit some of them, it's like planets apart, you know, and in Mormonism, it's a canyon the size of the Grand Canyon, the difference between how men and women are treated. And which that was a lot of stuff I'm still coming to terms with on myself, with myself as the trauma from all of that. And so those two, Bryce and Braden, they did, there was a lot of things they presented, Bryce from the historical aspect, Braden from his own, because Braden left about the same time I did, which was in 2015 for the same reason. And, you know, Braden served a mission. He was in Korea and he, there was a lot of things. And so there's a lot of shared experiences between me and him, but they were vastly different because he's a man. And so I would come in and say, well, from a woman's point of view, this, da 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 And yeah, this, and da 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 Or I would correct things like when they talked about the penalties with the, the temple covenants. And I'm like, yeah, I went through when they had those. <laughs> this is what you actually promise is to let someone else kill you, not kill yourself, you know, that kind of thing. So <clears throat> they would read them. And of course, you know, there's that little hitch of, oh, I just heard my name on this podcast I'm listening to all the time. Bryce and I met through Zoom at Sunstone because it was the first year of the pandemic. And then it was August of that year, which was what? three years ago now, I think, um, 2021. And it was episode 52, but they were like, let's have you on and interview you. So I was like, cool, I'll tell my story. I spent an hour and a half telling my story. And at the time, the book that they were doing a deep dive into was Naked Communist by Cleon Skousen. And so I just sort of commented on some things. I was, did a quick read of the chapter that Graydon was coming, doing that day and everything. And so they were like, hey, come back on for the next Naked Communist. So two episodes later, episode 54, we're doing the Naked, that, starting it. And Bryce was like, oh, we decided to make Shannon a co-host. And I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> That's That's awesome. To get you to stop making those I long comments. <laughs> Just make them myself instead of them having to read it, you know. Yeah, <laughs> and, and no, that's great. Really I didn't know fun. that you tackled that book. I'm, I'm gift. I definitely have to go through it. That was one of my father's books, and that was one that, um, yeah, I actually I flipped through again recently, mm -hmm. um, and just even just like the first chapter just made me feel really, really sad <laughs> to think about uh, how just how really negative it is, especially towards uh, atheists, which I think yep. my family didn't know at the time, but that's, I, I realized that, that, and that's how my deconstruction went. Actually, I realized I didn't believe in God first. And yeah. so the Mormonism kind of fell, you know, obviously after that, as a consequence of that, but um, yeah, that book has some very strong language, I think. And it's, it's just really like any, everything evil, lasciviousness, it's just like, if you're an atheist, it's just like the worst of everything. And yep. I, I don't know, it was just kind of a sobering moment to like remind myself of the rhetoric that you know my parents were raised under and um mm -hmm. yeah I, I guess in my own experience of course as i eventually identified one i obviously don't see it as a bad thing anymore and i knew my parents did but I, yeah reading that book was just another like i yeah. guess a really reminder of really how strongly um they view it it's not just bad if they, if I tell them I'm an atheist, it's really, really, really it's bad. Satanic. Like I might as well say like I'm a murderer and I'm a child yep. molester. Not like I might as well. Just it's the same thing to them. You have so. denied God. You will be a son of perdition. Yeah. You'll be outer darkness. Yeah, right. That's all of it. Yeah, it was, so it was kind of sad. Was, I, I'm going to check that out. Yeah. Anyway, How did yeah. Shannon do as a co-host when she first came on? Well, it, see, Shannon and I share this curse, and this curse <laughs> is uh, we cannot shut the hell up. Uh, yep, so yeah. immediately we gelled, like it was. It was of course, great. Uh, and that's the that's the other problem is like him and Braden episodes were like an hour and a half. Him and me, it's like three, four hours <laughs> long. <laughs> There's no time limit on YouTube or wherever, right? Yeah, exactly. So we, I mean, uh, Shannon and I, like we. 
because we come from like we come from the same culture, but from vastly different backgrounds and different shared lived experiences, um, it was abundantly clear that her contributions to the show were so valuable from the get go to bring in the woman's perspective, to bring in the BYU uh, person attendees perspective, uh, to bring in the perspective of somebody um, who is who is lived through a lot of the historical events that we reference and talk to about on and talk about on the podcast um, to have the lived experience of somebody who was in church and having those conversations. Um, it brings it from the abstract into the real uh, and Shannon's voice and her contributions and her lived experience. Um, it just, it, it immediately struck me that like, you know, during just her interview, when we first had her on episode 52, I was like, this is, this is lightning in a bottle. This person is really intelligent. She knows what she, and she sees the problems. She has a message to get out there um and so that was kind of um that influenced my decision heavily to be like um we're gonna bring shannon on as a full-time co-host <laughs> like this can't just be a guest this can't just be doing only naked communist episodes she needs to or her voice needs to be here to contribute to every subject material that we're covering because we just need that diversity of opinion and also we get along and we have fun together and we're good friends um as a result of all of this so what started out as a professional um relationship has become very much a deep um uh, and long-lasting friendship and uh, in uh, like i <clears throat> I think that my my perspective has diversified and broadened so much just having Shannon to bounce ideas off of and to um, to deal to, um, you know, I'll use this example, right? Every six months we watch General Conference and we do a General Conference review episodes. Um, and my, you know, my partner didn't grow up in the church. She grew up, you know, not religious at all. So when I am down in the dumps for the week leading up to general conference and the week after it, and, you know, my partner doesn't understand it. She, she sees what I'm going through. She sees the emotional turmoil, but she can't empathize with it. She can only sympathize. Right. Um, and to have Shannon to go to and be like, holy shit, did you see what he said in this talk? And, and to, to process that trauma with is, uh, I mean, uh, I think that we all, some people who have experienced this cult, have a life experience with this cult, we need somebody to commiserate with. We need somebody to relate the to with these experiences. Um, and for a lot of us, uh, for some of us, uh, it happens in our marriage and our partnerships. Um, but for some of us who are, you know, in interfaith relationships or, you know, people who don't have the, 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 you know, the Mormon background, they just can't understand. So Shannon has been such a boon to my personal life in just the only that regard, uh, helping me process my own journey and my own, you know, my own, uh, understanding of the cult. So, Long-winded um, answer, non-answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. And I'm, I'm happy to see this kind of stuff um, and this kind of collaboration happening more because, because Mormonism is such a male-dominated space and women's voices are quite actively suppressed. But um, the... Uh, it, you know, so coming out of it and deconstructing a, a lot of those same things kind of come across and come along because the, the men are, are used to having been empowered and 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 speaking and um, and women are used to disempowerment. And so it can take it's a bit more of a journey sometimes to work up to being able to participate and and feel that you belong in spaces. And so um, but we do change the spaces that we're in. And I'm so I. I'm not a co-host on Mormonism Live, but I um, I do support work and I do pop up and you know and occasionally, especially if we are talking about purity culture in the church, then for sure the um, the host Bill and RFM want me on and they'll make sure that I'm I'm participating and they'll talk with me beforehand. But um, I've know that's something that um, the Mormonism Live audience and in the chat has said is that even even without being a co-host on the show, just being part of the show now has changed the atmosphere of it, um, has changed the respectability and respectfulness in the chat um, and and so on and so forth. And, there's, and I am able also to offer a perspective that is is completely missed sometimes. And I mean, even just uh, for example, they were going over some scriptures a while back, and it was, um, um, they they didn't realize that these these were the verses from the Bible that because because of coded language, um, I, I've always understood these to be those passages to be about 
abortion, about causing an, an abortion deliberately in a woman that you suspect is has been cheating on you. And so if if the, if she is pregnant with somebody else's child, this this magic spell formula in the Bible is was meant to induce. And that was something Just that they they completely so missed. Yeah, they didn't they didn't recognize that that's what um, that was about. So anyway, it's just things like that. There's things that, um, yeah, and, that's right. and yeah, and both of them have said at times, like um, even, even knowing and seeing the disparity, sometimes just hearing the way that I word something, it's just something they never thought of before. Right. So. And, and I liked Maven's perspective so much that that's why I wanted to collaborate with her on this show. And it's it really more women's voices are needed in the um, ex-Mormon especially atheist ex-Mormon sphere. There really are not that many. I mean, right now, Bryce and I are on R and Ra's uh, show every Sunday. We're reading Joseph's myth. We're going through the Book of Mormon. And Bryce was on first. People were like, That's oh, you need Bryce. And Bryce is, yeah. Joseph's and, myth. Myth, yeah. yep. And, and Bryce was like, you need my co-host because you need her perspective as somebody who's read the book more than anybody ever should. And- the experience of it all. And so that is a thing I keep throwing out there every time I'm on is, yeah, this is what's happening, you know? And that was, yeah. uh, it was nice to be able to also show that the Book of Mormon is not a good missionary tool <laughs> and Mormons don't use it that way. They use it against members, not against, for bringing in non-Mormons yeah. because there's not much in it that helps to bring in a non-member. But anyway, side issue, but yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I want to give just a shout out, I think for Bryce for doing that in the first place. Um, and also, you know, for, for the, like the men that have done that for me as well, because that's, that's really, we need a bridge. Mm -hmm. And I think just, um, you know, by you recognizing that Bryce and saying we we need to pull her in. Um, I, I don't know. I just want to do, I guess, a shout out for um, and Gene, you know, obviously for this collaboration as well. Gene is a great people person. He connects with everybody, um, male, female, anything in between, uh, just all types of people. It surprises me how many people he knows. But it's we we need some in spaces where women's voices aren't as valued. Um, it really helps to have a man bring us and invite us in um, and kind of show and kind of give an example of like this, this is how you do it. This is, yeah. you know, I, I am valuing a, a, a woman Modeling. by doing it this way. Yeah. Because it can be, it can be invisible. I, there's a lot of men in the church. I mean, even now, and even those who deconstruct who, who genuinely feel like they, they are a feminist or they're equality minded yep. and they're just, um, no understanding. It's just, it's just completely hidden to them all of the yeah. ways that they're used to not seeing women. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just just because it's not a conscious thought in your mind. I I disvalue women's voices. That doesn't mean it's not there in mm -hmm. in your actions and in your words and everything else. Oh, your, it's yeah. it's it abounds. I mean, it's <laughs> almost born in your DNA because it's just yeah. the way you're raised from day yeah. one. You it's know, it's the, the same. Is. It's the same as racism. It's the same. You know. Oh, yeah. So yeah, that's one of those things. One of the things we do on Glassbox is a deep dive into a book um, that's had an effect in Mormonism, and you know, we'll take it chapter by chapter and go in through it. So like the first one was what was it? Case for Book of Mormon, Bryce? Uh, no, first one was Naked Communists. Was and it the then Naked? We did. Then it was Case for the Book of Mormon. After that, I believe. No, I, I think it's the other way around. Because I don't remember reading it. And so, yeah, there's case for the book. He was the other way around. Yeah. I, and then I'm Naked struggling. Communist, which is what I ended up taking over and, and really enjoyed because I also, there's two listeners, one that lives in Poland, one lives in Serbia, who contacted me and were like, um, Shannon, you got this wrong. And I was like, oh, tell me what was right then. Tell me how to get this right. You know, because I was trying to present the real view of communism. And so um, rather than Cleon Skousens and you know that kind of thing and so I they ended up I actually would send stuff to them first and have them proofread it and so tell me make sure I got things right and they would you know all this stuff and so I made two incredibly good friends that way um which I never would have if I wasn't on this podcast you said with Skousens or with who with two friends one in Serbia one in Poland oh okay I have actual yeah. experience with communism they have had actual experience and with Nazis too, because some of that got referenced mm. as well in the Naked Communists. And there were some times where I was comparing Nazis and communists, and that was fascinating as well. But, you know, both their countries are still recovering from damage done to them. 
And so it was absolutely fascinating to get real lived experience, you know, especially because I had another person coming at me saying, you're terrible, you know, because they love communism. But it's like, you know, it was interesting. It was fascinating. And then the next one we did, <laughs> and this was Bryce's turn again to, to do the deep dive, was Miracle of Forgiveness, mm. which I think is probably the most damaging book the church has ever produced. And I had never read it before, right? Like, I, yeah. as I said, right, I left as, a, you know, as a late teenager. So there's a lot of experiences that I never had. And reading The Miracle of Forgiveness because I confessed to my bishop that I was masturbating never happened to me. So I finally said, you know, like, this book has been so impactful. This has caused so much damage. This book has blood on its pages. Uh, why? I need to, yeah. I need to find out why I need to reveal this book for what it truly is. And we need to point out these damaging and harmful messages. And that was a brutal slog to get through that. That was awful. Book. That oh, was God. an awful, awful experience. I was but, required oh, to read it four times. Yeah. Like some people might not know that it's not even for sale at Deseret book anymore. No. And it wasn't. And they stopped that in what year was it? They stopped it, Bryce. I think it was like the, the early tens, 2010s or something like that. That, I think I I going? know I think John John DeLynn with Mormon Stories I think had a concentrated effort he's covered the book extensively and I think like a campaign if I'm recalling correctly there was yeah a concentrated effort to get it off of shelves at Desert Book to try to get the church to stop uh, yeah. endorsing it to children and so I think it was I think it was out of that which would be yeah another way where where criticism you know, coming at the church can cause it to make a change. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, small his, changes, but yeah. Yeah. Spencer Kimball's descendants were begging them to stop selling it for decade for a couple decades. Uh, yeah, I was required four times, and the first one was actually before my mission because I had a depression bad enough I'd reach suicidal point, and of course I was taken to a bishop to 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 get it fixed, and the bishop spent two hours interrogating me trying to find out what sexual sin I committed because women in the church don't get depressed unless they committed a sexual sin because I had not yeah. oh. <laughs> bishops have so much psychological training oh, they right. don't ask you sin yes. than some other oh, just, and there's not like a myriad of other reasons that have to do mm -hmm. with how we're raised and how we're treated uh, that might directly exactly impact that different. yes no, it's, it's got to be sin of course. And it's my fault. Yeah. And then it was, do you have secret lesbian desires for your best friend and whatever? And so then it was, okay, you need to go on a mission. A mission will cure you, but do read Miracle of Forgiveness first. My mission president required it twice. So when we were doing cure this you book. Of, of what? Was it cure you of sin or cure you of depression? Or, or I guess both. Yeah. I just, I just can't in case I didn't com admit to anything I did wrong. Oh, okay. Did, then you could still get something. Uh, yeah, exactly. So when we were doing this, I mentioned, I had said on there, you know, I have many times and that I was required twice on my mission. And I remember it being very bad. And that was the one time in my life I actually kept a daily journal. So I went through my journals from my mission that year. And uh, my daughter actually on the last one finally said, mom, please stop. This is just destroying you. You need to stop reading those. And I did because I couldn't bear what I had written down. And I know very few it. people who've been able to go back and read mission, well, journals, including and myself. That's, yeah. that's one of the things that I realized in it that I had never realized is how abusive my mission president was to me. You thought Bryce, he was doing that lovingly. Well, Bryce love, saw right? so many things that I just took a photograph of stuff I'd written down and sent it to him. There was one that I spent two weeks going, why was he playing with my hair? Why was I okay with him with his fingers in my hair? You know, and I just went on like that for days, you know, stuff like that. It was awful. <laughs> there were times we would be recording an episode and Bryce would have to say, Shan, I have to stop for a minute. And he would just go off in another room for half an hour and I would wait for him to be able to just emotionally be able to handle to come back, finish the fucking thing. It was awful. Yeah. yeah. It was awful. So sorry. So because much like, 
it like we all have been touched by that book right and like and it's weird because it's like we we hold the book up as like a focal point of like damaging mormon culture but like that book sprang from mormon culture and then just went on to amplify and you know and and um ensconce those practices and those cultural tendencies even harder into the culture and right so it's and like maybe, maybe make a lot of money for the church in the meantime yeah, it gave I away mean, a lot of them, actually. Copies. Yeah, yeah, right. B so, bishops would have the the just day, stacks of them. Yeah. Yeah. It, but at the end of the day, right, like you read a passage and you realize how much damage and how many lives have been taken because of this. Uh, and I and I say that very deliberately. I choose my language very deliberately. How many lives have been taken by this book? Right. Because the people who have been recommended this book, like in like in the case with Shannon, right, like you're experiencing depression. Uh, you were taken to your bishop to fix the depression. And he said, you need to read this book and go on a mission and that'll fix you. Um, and, Which the, it did not. Uh, and, and all that it did was reinforce all of the problems that were causing, that were arguably causing this depression and then these, these uh, negative feelings to begin with. It just solidified those concepts in your mind and caused more damage. Right. And, and actually, like to, you survived. To contrast that, that, yeah. To contrast that real quick. Two years ago, Peter Pan Peanut Butter Company withdrew like $120 million worth of products because a couple dozen people got sick. Yeah. Exactly. Right, 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 right. Compared so, to people like, committing suicide over the what, thousands who committed thousands. suicide over that book. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. So like the damage is real. Right. And like, I, I'm, I mean, most of us, I think the, that it's, uh, that I I'm playing on the right side of statistics. When I say most of us have been touched by uh, people to choosing to end their life, um, within Mormonism, um, people who are close to us or even people who are, you know, a couple of degrees separated, right? Like it's touched basically every one of us in some way or another. Right. So I saw the, 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 uh, the book just, um, chronicles all of the tendencies that lead to this, all of the social and cultural pressures that lead to people um, being pushed into a uh, into a suicidal state, um, especially when they have those proclivities um, to begin with already uh, via chemical imbalances, via uh, the nurture of their their upbringing and whatever. The church only amplifies those problems. It only makes those exacerbates those problems for individuals. And like, uh, yeah, and there were some times that it's like. Like I, I, I need to take a break. I need to step away from this so that I can, I, I can be more rational about this conversation instead of just screaming. Right. And, and don't get me wrong. Like just screaming into the microphone, it has its place. Right. When I started naked Mormonism, uh, in, in Boyd K Packer died when I was like five or six episodes in, and I did a special episode that was titled rot in hell, Boyd K Packer. I danced on that son of a bitch's grave because I hate that human being, right? And I felt very justified in doing it. And the entire episode consisted of me pouring a very tall glass of whiskey and reading his talks into the record and just riffing and yelling about it. And it was the most popular episode. It put me on the map in a lot of respects because it resonated with a lot of people because I was speaking to the true lived experience of so many people who have been damaged by Boyd K. Packer. And uh, I look back on the episode and I made a lot of mistakes. It was like altogether, it was a bad episode, but I did it with the emotion that felt real at the time that was very real to me. And at the end of the day, it's like I, I informed people about this damage, damaging cultural thing that exists in the zeitgeist of Mormonism. That makes the endeavor worthwhile. And that is the way that I also approached Miracle of Forgiveness and the case for the book of mormon and all of you know and and you know at, at the acute level those those uh, individual projects but also at the broader sense uh the career of mormon communication um of being a communicator about mormonism a lot of it does stem from this uh this concept of this abstract you know altruistic drive of like this cult hurts people more people need to know about this. The more yeah. people that know about the damage and the abuse that this institution does, the more people are inoculated against it will uh, the, that will not invite the missionaries into their home to hear their message. And You're I see that as an overall better trend for society. You're right. in favor of full disclosure and informed consent. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Transparency. If and about how many episodes did it take to cover the miracle of forgiveness? Roughly. It was 10, well, wasn't it? It was a year or so. I think, yeah, it was about 10, 12 episodes. So we do episodes every two weeks. So, yeah. 
And it's every other episode is those. That segment when we look into a book is called The Sword of Layman. And so, yeah, we do. The next one we did was Millennial Messiah by Bruce R. McConkie, which was me reading it. Um, that was interesting. I didn't expect what we got from that. I absolutely did not expect it to glorify so much, just revel in the idea of all the death and destruction at the second coming of Christ. He yeah. reveled in that. I was like, holy shit, what is wrong with you? You know, it was just, holy God. But then, and then last year we did Saints, that new history of the church. Bryce is the one who did the deep dive on that. And it just, he was angry the whole time over all the stuff they were glossing over. Yep. <laughs> but I've heard Not also really. that it's been like, it, it has gone into some stuff. It's just funny to hear even like active members having a book like that start to be their way out because yes. it, it did start to introduce at least some things, little baby steps along the yep. way. Right. Wow. And how is that going still? Like, did they finish the set they, or is that just not talked about anymore? I know a second volume was made, but that's the last I remember hearing about it actually. The, I think the third volume is set for, for publication 2025, I believe. Oh, and okay. that gets up to uh, the turn of 1900 to 1950, I think or something yeah. like that. So I can, Oh, be they're not going to stop. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> they'd have to have like this canal of people leaving to stop putting this out. Yeah, oh, yeah. no, so, overall, I think it's inoculating plenty of people, but uh, yeah. you mean a bigger canal? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the Nile, <laughs> it's the Amazon. Yes, yeah. so this year we're doing Approaching Zion by Hugh Nibley, which is just honestly hilarious to me because. <laughs> You're, you're hitting all the hard hitting names. I, I know, yeah. that, which is yeah. the point, you know, but it's like, who is the chief apologist of the church? It's Hugh Nibley. It was him. So, you know, in this book, I was like, it, it really got into apparently his diatribes about money, which I just still wish Jonah Hex was real and we could get him to go pull him out of his grave and ask him what he thinks of what the church is doing with money now. Because <laughs> yeah. I really want to know what he nibbly would say. Because he had no qualms about shitting on a leader, you know? And so, anyway, he's interesting. But who asked who, um, what, what does your, your audience look like? Uh, who is it? And what about them, you know, makes them compelled to come and find your content and, and participate in it versus any, you know, the other podcasts that are out there? Is there like, is there an age range, especially if you're hitting these like Hugh Nibley and, you know, McCarthy or do you just do it for both of you? <laughs> or is it, yeah, that's a lot of it, you know? So, like, we actually. It's kind of an interesting uh, like relationship that we have with our audience because in so many regards, like we do a podcast that Shannon and I want to do. And the listeners who come are people who are interested in the topics that we cover because we're interested in those topics. Uh, so um, when it was Brayden and I, our demographics look like Brayden and I. And Brayden is, uh, you know, like two years older than me, right? So uh, our demographics looked like that. When we brought Shannon on, our demographics shifted uh, to have more of a pull towards people who look and are interested in uh, things like Shannon is, right? So I, I think there is, I mean... Uh, that is to say that like we pay we pay very little attention to like the demographics of like what we are wanting to reach out to like or what audiences we're wanting to tap into. We don't approach the podcast with that kind of um, with that kind of generative uh, process. Right. We approach but there's it still of, things like, you we, can yeah that you yeah. can notice over time, and and that, I guess that's what I'm asking. What are you noticing about who is naturally coming and to your podcast and finding it? Um, and when they when they email you or they comment, you know, what are, what is it that they're finding helpful to them um, and th that kind of stuff? There are many who come to us because of naked Mormonism yeah. and it's they like Bryce, which Bryce is very, very good at what he does, what he presents, how he presents it, everything. And so th I think the majority of the people who come come from there but we have never never mos we have exmos we have pmos we have nuanced members you know we have all of those in there and it's it is interesting seeing it but it's like my friend in poland and my friend in serbia neither one of them have ever been mormon and so they but they find everything they hear fascinating and so it's it is really because it is kind of a niche area of it all because not even 
you know, this, it doesn't even appeal to all ex Mormons or, or whatever. It's like, because we are trying to get into those things that slip through the cracks. So our most downloaded episodes are, are the general conference ones. And because we talk about the stuff, especially that nobody else is talking about, or like one of those recently with, um, Oh God, I keep forgetting. Patrick Kiernan, Kieran, Kiernan, Kieran, Kieran, Kieran. Kieran. The new, the new apostle, we did an episode on him where Bryce was pointing out all of the things in his history that show that he's dangerous. Yep. He's not the, you know, uh, the best one for the ex-Mormon community because he was willing to say victims are victims and be nice to them. No, yeah. there's really yeah. dangerous shit in his background that nobody that talked a, about. A really low bar for leadership. I think you would agree. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, like, when we're talking, yeah. the guy ran a yeah. PR firm for fuck's sake. All right. Yeah. Sorry, I keep popping out language bombs. No. <laughs> All good. All good. <laughs> yeah. So, at any rate, yeah, those kind of things. And that's so, does that appeal to everybody? Not always. No. But I think there are people that would appeal to if they knew about us. But yeah, you know, it just kind of happens as we yeah. spread a little further. And little yeah, further. I didn't get, like I didn't know. I didn't know about your podcast and I didn't know about the naked Mormonism. That is something I think because of my family history and, and background within, because like this was something. Yeah, that my dad was just really, really into. I I'm that's what I'm interested in, in coming to find. And I, I didn't know right. that it was there. So I think so I'm thinking maybe anyone who either is like me and it, like I wasn't into that as much. I didn't internalize as much of it, but I, I can understand it you know, again through the connection of my family. But I imagine people who, who did read this book who are very into it and they're kind of deconstructing, you know, from all the way over this, <laughs> this end of the spectrum. Um, I think that they would find these kind of shows helpful, especially I, yeah, I guess I'm assuming an older gen uh, like a demographic with some of these books because I'm I'm just thinking that these names were bigger for them and this would have been more in their um what's that the Milu but right, guys. I'm yeah and and but I might be wrong so I'm I'm definitely open and, and curious to know if uh if there are more younger people who didn't have this like shoved in their face there are, that there are, are also coming yes. well but, and the, but is that I don't yeah. know are you getting a lot of these people who are because they all have grandpas. They yeah, do. But the, but the thing you have to take note of, though, is while those happen, there's a lot that happened when these books were published, the effect they had is still ongoing. Exactly. For sure. Generational. Oh, for sure. It's generational. And so they do still have an impact on today, partly because, you know, that's how our parents were raised and, you know, whatever. But but there is still that impact today. And, and it's also showing the variations in types of presidents of the church. Cause yes. like right now we call Russell M. Nelson revisionist rusty because of what mm -hmm. he does. You know, you, when you have ones like David O. McKay was a little more willing to listen to the other side, um, you know, different things like that and how they respond to each other, you know, talking about things like when Spencer Kimball did the 1978, okay, well let's, let's make black people as normal God as everyone else. Blacks, yeah. yeah. What, what did he do? He made sure that the three people who fought him the most in the Quorum of the Twelve were not there. Mm -hmm. Then they could have a unanimous vote. It's a miracle. Marky Peterson was not there, <laughs> you know, and then all of a sudden, okay, yeah. God said us now. So since they're not there, we're going to tell you how to vote. Yeah, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So, you know, learning all of that, that this kind of stuff still happens now, you know, looking at, at everything that went on with President Uchtdorf. Well, El, whatever you call him now, you know, <laughs> Dieter F. Uchtdorf. First, he was an apostle. He was the um, counselor. But then, oh, guess what? The guy donated to the Democratic National Convention. This guy yeah. speaks this way and this way. So let's dump him back down and not let him and do anything. And he thinks that uh, a leader of the church could make mistakes. Yeah. <gasps> we can't have that, revisionist yeah. Rusty says in Dallin H. Hoax says, mm -hmm. you can't have that. I mean, Oaks is really the one running the church right now. Rusty's to dementia. But, you know, those kind of things. And so these are all things we're pointing out because we're showing, you know, we've got this history of all of this stuff going. And this is, you know, especially Bryce is very good at watching these patterns through history. And so us pointing these out, showing, you know, this book came out. This is what effect it's had. 
you know, or like Q Dibley. The reason why he was never a general authority is because they don't like to do that, especially not a, an apostle, though for some reason I thought he was because he was such a big name when I was growing up. Yeah. But it's because he was an apologist and because he's willing to criticize the leadership, you know, those kind of things. But they were perfectly willing to tell him, we need you to write this rebuttal to no man, uh, no man knows my history. So go write that. Go, mm -hmm. go do this. Oh, we need to have you address the Book of Abraham issues, which took him six years to do, even though he was considered an Egyptologist. And what was his rebuttal to it all? Oh, we don't have all the papyri. That's yeah. all. Yep. Missing scroll. Yep. It's yeah. just, we're missing, missing it. it. We're missing the one that's the Book of Abraham because you have to have faith. Yeah. Very specific so, anyway. number of feet as, as well, I think. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> we're missing. Yeah, like, um, I don't know if do, they can measure the missing part, but they get it. <laughs> I do tape to, it together. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I want to vocalize something as well, and and this kind of uh, wraps uh, together a kind of a few things that we're discussing here. Um, when we're doing these the sort of layman segments, these long form book reviews, uh, with the other uh, the, the person who's reading it, like we trade years of who's reading the book, uh, and then the other co host uh, c creates the companion segment along with it. And the the A segment, whatever that companion segment is, we try and make it relevant to the subject material that we're covering in the sort of layman, right? So when I was going through Saints, the Standard of Truth, uh, you know, the new history book of the church, Shannon's A segments were examining different ways that high demand religions exert cult mind control and, and influence and undue influence on their members. So it was every single episode was that companion piece. We would start talking about how information control behavior behavior control, thought control, mm. emotion control uh, is replete within Mormon culture. And then we would use that to springboard into the segment uh, that we were covering of saints that day, because at the end of the day, the book is about controlling information and controlling the narrative of Mormon history. Uh, so every time- nice. So a nice meta view. Exactly, right? Kind of so get, getting people in that frame of mind to, to and that lens to look through what you're reading. That's brilliant. Exactly. That's great. And, and we also try and do that to make it so that when we're reading these books from Hugh Nibley, from Bruce R. McConkie, these titans of Mormon culture from the last generation, that we are trying to make it evergreen. So that the that somebody who is a young, uh, you know, newly minted ex-Mormon who knows nothing about these people or their heritage, who has heard the names, uh, maybe has seen one of the those books on their parents' bookshelf growing up, but they don't know anything about Hugh Nibley. They don't know anything about Bruce R. McConkie whatever we try and make those a segments um uh, you know to, to capture the impact that this book had or that this person that this icon had uh so like we we try and bring it to a reality try and try and get the younger listeners familiar with these concepts and why this book or why this person was so impactful with what they did uh and which also has the added effect of like uh, um, of older generation listeners who come into the comments and they're like hey you missed this or hey you need to talk about this as well and like like it, it gets them engaged as well, which is it, it creates a, a broader conversation of people who, you know, uh, are, you know, learning from a vast uh, variance of experience within this. And like wanted... and that's a, a hard thing, too, is like making evergreen content that's also current event related. So mm -hmm. that's kind of one of the, the, the struggles that we deal with in our creative process is like, all right, so this is what's going on. This is today's Mormon headline of the week. Now, how are we going to examine this subject? Object in a way that is going to be evergreen so that anybody who's listening to this 10 years in the future doesn't need to know what's going on on social media this very moment to understand the totality of it. We, we, we try yeah, and, and, larger and bridge context. that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's kind of our aim and focus. And that's why we're kind of like, you know, three degrees of niche, like niche, niche, niche. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, I think so it else... limits the audience and the appeal, but it also makes yeah. it really fun for us to do. And I think really useful historically as well, because there does, and this is more part of the, you know, thought control and information control is that the the more the church changes, the more it wants to pretend that it's always been that way. And even as individual members, we're, we're happy to play that game when we 
we hear about things in the past that are, are troubling to us, to modern sensibilities, we really like to put that blame on individuals or on their broader society and pretend that it's not coming from the church, that it's just an example of, you know, this is the church is a product of, you know, it's in its own time and place. And so it's not divorced from the politics of the nation. So anything bad that seems to creep in, you you want to separate it and say that wasn't really the church. And maybe older generations thought it was, but it was definitely from the outside world and they just integrated it. When you go through these kinds of books, I, I think you're really showing and, and proving it, it's definitely coming from the top down. It's not just that an entire generation misunderstood the gospel that they were being taught. Um, it is a really easy cop out for young, younger generations to to kind of excuse or, or dismiss the way that the older generations think um, as, you know, again, as if they did it themselves from the bottom up rather than um, vice versa. So I think what you're doing here is important for that reason as well to kind of remove, at least for anyone with that knowledge, remove the ability to try to do that or minimize the the impact that, that these things had. Yeah. Thank you. It's also like, I think the value of the internet nowadays, mm -hmm. things can't slip through the cracks anymore. It's always yeah. going to be out there. Well, they can try. The they can do it on their machine. own stuff. Yep. Yeah. They do try. Yeah. yeah. But stuff. if everyone else is talking about it, they can't they can't shut everyone else down. So yeah. Well thank you very much, Shannon and Bryce. Um we're gonna have you know links in our description that'll be linked to the some of the podcasts we mentioned and the episodes. And um we want our viewers to go check out the glass box and uh, hope everybody enjoys the show um like subscribe and share if you can and any closing thoughts maven or any anybody else <laughs> it was nice to be on here this is rather fun meeting both of you it was that's right it was it's been great all right yeah, one last thing again. i'll say oh go ahead bryce I was going to say, good to see you again, Gene. And I'm looking forward to this year's Sunstone when I will be going. I missed last year because we were buying a house. Like I was signing the paperwork the day of Sunstone, right? The first oh. day of Sunstone. So I'm looking yeah. forward to seeing you there this year. Uh, yeah, even though you, you didn't go like, last year, I sent you a bunch of pictures. Yeah, and I was like, man... <laughs> <laughs> Those are all my favorite peeps to hang out with. And I missed it this year. I only get one opportunity a year to spend time with these people. Yeah. Uh, so I'm looking forward to this year when I can make that happen. Uh, and Maven, I hope to meet you in person at some point as well. This is I, I've had a lot of fun today. So thank you both. Very she much. might come to Sunstone. Maybe that would this be year. nice. That'd be That'd awesome. Be like a goal. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So also one last thing is that um, when Bryce appeared on Mormon News Roundup last fall, I think I messaged you and I said, I hope I'm 25% as smart as you are in my episode, but I think I only hit like 17% as smart, but you know, <laughs> it was a challenge. So it is hard. Thank you for example. Maybe I'll, I'll come on again someday. And, uh, <laughs> and it's been, mm -hmm. been really great chatting with you guys and we'll see everybody next time. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Bye, Bye everyone.